Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. Back on the PM Research Steam Engine today and on the journey towards live steam, we need to get a lubrication system going. You can't run an engine on live steam without proper oiling. So we're going to talk about what kind of oils to use and build a system to deliver it to the engine. So let's go. Here's where I'm going to start. This is a basic drip oiler. The engine needs six. And because it's brass and a very intricate shape, I think this is a really good candidate for a form tool. So I've got a piece of high speed steel here from the junk bin. This was actually donated by a viewer, I think. And it looks like a good candidate for grinding this tool. The width is just about right for the surfaces of the oiler that are below the hex head. So I'm going to clean it up with some acetone, get it good and degreased. Then we'll blue it up. And then I'm going to scribe the profile that I need on this tool. So it's a small diameter and then a much larger diameter and then there's a 45 degree chamfer between them. So I'm drawing half of the 2D projection of that shape onto the end of the tool. Now because this is a precision grinding job and there's very little material to remove, I'm going to use my D-bit grinder. Now I don't have a good way to hold big square stock like this in the work head of the D-bit grinder, so I'm just free handing it. But the D-bit grinder has a 600 grit cup wheel on it with very sharp corners, so it's great for this kind of precision work. And the 600 grit is slow going, but it gives me really good control. You can see on the left there, I'm wearing a respirator because this diamond dust is very nasty stuff. And I'm also wearing a head mounted magnifier there because this is very small work and I've got a lot of light in there. My eyes are not what they used to be. The critical dimension on this is the difference between the two steps because that's what's going to establish the two diameters. And because we're making three surfaces at once, precision is fairly important here because if any one of these dimensions is off, all three surfaces are going to end up in the wrong place. So it's pretty important. But the nice thing about this operation is that you can just keep grinding one surface or the other until you land in the right place. Now the underside of this tool is a little bit of a mess because I was freehanding it, but the clearances are there and that's all that matters. Now you can measure all you want, but the proof is in the cut. So I'm going to make some test parts here to make sure that my grind is as good as I hope it is. So I've got a piece of round stock in here and I'm going to plunge in with the tool. And this round stock is larger diameter than the final oil cups are, but that doesn't matter. I can just go in until the small diameter is correct and then the outer diameter should also be correct. Now one thing I wasn't sure about is whether the thin stem is going to be strong enough to hold this part towards the end as we turn it here. So this is a good test for that. I'm trying to do it this way because it means I can do the whole part in one setup because I can do all of the drilling and everything on the big end of the cup. But yeah, that didn't work. However, most of the cutting forces were right at the end when both diameters are being cut. So I did a test where I turned the larger diameter down first and then I just pushed the form tool in until that side of the tool was just touching the work and that worked great. So I think this process will work. Now, if this had not worked, I could have just flipped the tool over, reversed the lathe and cut it with the larger diameter up against the chuck. But then I would have had to find a way to flip the parts over and drill them out from the other side and it would have been a big hassle. So I'm also drilling out my test part here just to make sure that the little stem can hold up to the drilling forces. And indeed that worked really, really well. Drilling the small hole that drains the oil out was tricky because it's very, very tiny hole that's very deep. So I'm gonna do that differently on the next part. I think I'm ready for the real deal. So here's the hex stock that came with the kit. I didn't want to do my test parts from this because I didn't know how much I had here. So I'm going to face off the end and then I'm going to bring my form tool in and line it up with the faced edge there. And then I'm going to move it over the thickness of the hexagonal section at the top of the oil cup. That's so you can put a wrench on it. And then in we go with the form tool. So moment of truth time. So we should go in until we've just formed the wide diameter there. We've just taken off the hexagonal area. I got part way in and had a flashback to when the stem broke on my first test part and decided, you know what, why don't I just put tail support in there? So I did and continued the cut. And this was going okay, except this is where I realized I had a taper in my tool. You can see that it should be cutting all the way along the hex there at this point, and it isn't. So I checked the stem here to see if I'm at the final diameter, and I am. But I figured, well, I can save this part by coming in with a grooving tool here and just straightening out the top half of the cup there but I'm gonna to have to regrind that wide section of that tool there to straighten it out. Getting it square was difficult because the dimensions are all so small, but that's looking pretty good. So I can finish drilling that out 
and you'll notice that I came in with the small drill at the end this time so that I only have to drill the little part of the stem out. I don't have to drill all the way through the cup first with the small drill, which made it much easier. Drilling a very high aspect ratio hole like that is very tedious because you have to clear chips extremely frequently. And now I can part it off. So the tool was ground such that the width of the tool was the profile that we needed to cut on the cup. So the parting is done on the hex section just behind the stem there. The last thing to do is just file that little parting nubbin off the bottom. So I got it carefully held in my copper soft jaws there and I just file that down until the hole is exposed. And oh, poop knuckles. Yeah, I squished it in the vise. That is something I didn't think of. Well, that was a bummer. Let's hope we have stock for six more of these and we'll call that another test part. But hey, after all these test parts, I got the order of operations dialed in perfectly. I got all my dimensions down. So I was able to crank out six of these cups in record time. That only took about 20 minutes and I could make these things all day. And then I switched to emery paper for the parting number so I don't squish anything in the vise and that worked beautifully. Last thing we need is some threads on the stem. So I'm gonna put a gauge pin that's the same size as the cup in there so I don't squish it with the chuck. And then I'm just gonna put these threads on here by hand with the tailstock die holder. No Tommy bars or anything needed here. These parts are so small that the threads cut very easily in there. It's a very tiny thread. On a couple of them, I didn't drill the stems quite deep enough. So I just came back in with that tiny drill in a pin vise. If you've never seen one of these, I happen to own it from my days in model railroading and Warhammer figure modeling, but it's a great tool here in the machine shop as well for drilling tiny, tiny holes. And a little deburr, and we are done with the six oil cups. So let's go ahead and install those on the engine now. If you please, a moment of silence for the brave test parts that gave their lives for this project. Not pictured, the first one that broke off and landed in the chip tray, never to be seen again. So we put one of these cups on each of the crosshead guide rails there, and one goes on the eccentric. What's cool about them is that they can go on the moving parts and they just carry the oil with them and lubricate the engine as it runs. The one on the connecting rod there is my favorite. I think that's really cool. Now let's talk about oil. Steam engine oil is a bit of a black art, but there's basically two types that you need. You need oil for lubricating all the little moving parts, and then you need oil for lubricating the cylinder. Until now, you've seen me put this stuff all over the place. This is just a basic three-in-one light machine oil. And if all you're ever gonna do is run the engine on compressed air, then this is fine. Put a bunch of this on everything and don't run the engine too long and it'll be just fine. However, for long-term running or running on live steam, this kind of stuff is not gonna cut it. So first up is a basic pin bearing and journal oil. This is an ISO 220 oil or what we used to call 90 weight. So this is just a basic gear oil. You can use it on all of the plane bearings, anything copper, bronze, brass, cast iron, anything that slides or spins or moves on the engine pretty much, all the external moving parts. This is what will go in all the drip lubricators that we just made. And you could use lots of different things for this, but any rough equivalent to a 90 weight gear oil would work just fine. Now, what about to lubricate the inside of the cylinder? Can you use regular gear oil like this? Absolutely not. For that, you need proper steam cylinder oil. So what's so special about steam cylinder oil? This is what's called a compounding oil. And what that means is it has a surfactant in it. So why can't you use any old oil in a steam cylinder? Well, think about what we're doing. In order to lubricate the inside of that cylinder, we're injecting the oil into the steam because it's the only way to get it in there. And so we're trying to create oiled surfaces in there with steam running on top of them. But of course, as we all know, oil and water don't mix and the steam will just scour the oil right off of those metal surfaces in there. So if you put any kind of regular oil in there, it's not gonna last five seconds when that steam hits it. What we need the oil to do is wet the surfaces in there through the steam. And wetting is kind of a colloquial term. What we really mean by that is we need a surfactant, which is an elaborate portmanteau for surface active agent. And that's something that can act on a surface in the presence of hot steam. 
There's different types of surfactants, but they all have the same basic structure. They are a molecule that is hydrophilic at one end and hydrophobic at the other, which means they attract water at one end and repel water at the other. And that allows them to mix with both oil and water. So this is how soap works. Soap is one of the most basic surfactants. And that's why you can wash oil off your hands with water if you use soap. So in principle, you could use something like dish soap as a wetting agent in steam cylinder oil, but it wouldn't hold up to the temperatures. It's very, very hot in there. The category of surfactants that we use in steam oil are called fatty alcohols. That's not to be confused with your Uncle Lenny, who is a fatty alcoholic. A fatty alcohol is a long chain molecule with an alcohol component at one end. Historically, the fatty alcohol that was used in steam cylinder oil was beef tallow, and that actually works pretty well. It has a ceiling of temperature on it though. Nowadays, we have synthetic fatty alcohols derived from ethylene, which work much better. And in fact, interestingly, the beef tallow in the steam cylinder oil was a ceiling on horsepower on steam engines. The way you make more power in a steam engine is by getting the steam hotter, and you do that with superheating. And you can superheat steam to insane levels with multiple stages of superheating. The problem is it gets too hot for the oil, the beef tallow in the oil starts to break down. But our little toy steam engine here would do just fine on beef tallow compounded oil if that's what you had. But any compounding oil you buy now, it's gonna be synthetic. Now I have an airline hooked up here right now, but eventually this is of course where the live steam will go in into the steam chest here. So the question is, how do you get the steam oil in there? Well, you use a lubricator. There are a lot of different types of lubricators. There are mechanical ones that you can buy or build. However, I'm gonna use this guy right here. This is a displacement lubricator. These things are fiendishly clever and very simple and very reliable. Now you can make these. Uh, I bought this one from PM Research, hashtag not sponsored. I did pay for this with my own money, but it's a very nicely made little displacement lubricator. And what's cool about them is you just plumb them into the steam line, preferably close to the engine, and it just automatically oils the engine with no moving parts. How on earth could that possibly work? Well, the secret is right there in the name, displacement. What happens is because this is plumbed into the steam line, the steam goes into the lubricator and it collects inside here, it condenses into water and oil of course floats on water. So the water runs down to the bottom and this displaces oil out into the steam line. And then periodically, you drain the water out the bottom with this little drain here. And then this particular model has a nice little needle valve here that allows you to control how much oil is allowed out into the steam line. All we need to do is make a little bit of plumbing to mount this on the engine. I'm gonna make a little T-pipe here to plumb in that lubricator. So I've got some scrap here that I'm gonna use. Sidebar, is that brass in a live steam environment? Oh my God, we're all gonna die. That is what a lot of comments on this video will say. So let's talk about dezincification. It is true that live steam will leach the zinc out of many copper alloys. And for this reason, bronze is actually preferred when extended contact with live steam is expected. However, this is a model steam engine that will probably see 10 hours of running on live steam in its entire life. And it's ridiculously overbuilt. So let's all calm down and enjoy this hobby. And I'm gonna make the little vertical pipe that comes up off the steam chest first. So I will face the end of this. And then I'm gonna set an indicator on the carriage there because I'm going to turn down a little shoulder that's gonna be threaded to go into the steam chest. Despite setting that indicator, I turned that shoulder too deep. So I faced off the end down to the proper thickness there. Now we can thread that. I had the tiny 256 die in there from the oil cups, but in goes the quarter 40 for the steam chest. And I'm also gonna undercut this thread so that it sits down firmly on the top of the steam chest. I'm using a threading tool for this because that 60 degree angle is good for getting in this tight space. You gotta do this very carefully because this is gonna be a thin wall tube when we're done. So don't take any more out of there than you need to. And then I'll finish up by drilling it out to make it into an actual pipe. And I do the drilling last so that the thread cutting doesn't risk distorting anything there. It's a pretty thin wall when we're done. A little deeper with a file. And since I figured it doesn't matter what diameter this pipe is, I might as well do a 10 thou pass here and clean it up. I would come to regret this a little bit later, but for now, let's part this off. And by popular fan demand, Yahtzee. And then I flip it around and face off the other side. And of course we lose all our concentricity when we flip something in a three draw chuck, but this is a plumbing fixture, so it really doesn't matter. You just need to counterbore that for the tapping size for quarter 40 so that this will be an extension pipe effectively. After a little deeper, there's our little vertical pipe. 
looking pretty snazzy. I think that turned out well. I actually really like making these little plumbing fixtures for steam engines. I find it quite rewarding. So we'll thread that in there, and now I can mock up the displacement lubricator. I thought it would look good if it kind of hung off the end of the steam chest here. So I'm just measuring how long the side pipe is going to need to be there. And then I went and made that off camera because it was the exact same process you just saw, just with a smaller thread. And now we just need to join those two into a T. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fish mouth this pipe so that I can get a nice clean joint between the two. So I'm setting it up with a V-block, center finding and edge finding on the end, and I'm just going to plunge straight down with an end mill. Now, if I had left that other pipe, the standard 3 8 diameter, this would be very easy. Plunge with a 3 8 end mill, fish mouth done, on to the next step. However, because I turned it down 10 thou like a crazy person, I had to mill it undersize, and now I need to get out the boring bar to enlarge it to the exact 365 diameter that I created. And to make this even more fun, my smallest boring bar is too big for this operation. Now this boring head takes half inch diameter boring bars, which is pretty large, and I don't have any stock that size from which to grind a smaller boring bar. However, I did find in the junk bin this old half inch end mill that was wrecked but had one good flute on it. So I ground this down into a field expedient tiny boring bar and was able to use this to open up the fish mouth to the final dimension. That was a lot more work than I expected, but the end result is quite good. The ends of the brass got pretty thin there and started to flare out a bit from the cutting, but otherwise it worked out quite well. We got a good fit there. Now to the silver soldering, and fixturing a part like this could be very tricky because it's so small, but this is a ceramic jeweler's fixture plate, and shout out to Robin Renzetti for showing me these things. It's an excellent way to fixture these little tiny parts and hold them perfectly still while you silver solder them. So I got my flux on there and I got the torch and I'm just going to heat this thing up. You can see how the ceramic pins and the ceramic plate can really take the heat there. Once that flux gets watery, touch the silver solder in there, maybe a little more on the other side. And that should be it. We'll just heat that a little longer, make sure it's all flowed well. And once it's cooled to black, then I quench it in water and that really helps keep the scale and other mess from sticking to it. Don't quench it while it's still red or you'll wreck your silver solder joint. And then I just clean it up to kind of a dull finish with scotch bright. Now you can go the extra step and polish these as well if you want, really make them look like jewelry, but they are going to tarnish over time no matter what you do, so keep that in mind. At the moment it's a T, but it's not a T pipe, so let's fix that by lining up the long section there with the drill, and then I'll just drill straight down between the threads that we cut and into the cross piece there. And then blow out the debris, and that's our T pipe all done. Let's thread it into the steam chest and see how it lands. Now, I had tightened this in place earlier and marked the position on the cross pipe so that after I fish mouthed it and soldered it together, it would land in the right place when tight. And I missed. Yeah, that never really works. Well, so it's time for a copper shim, and I've got one here that's almost the right size. So I'm just going to open it up a little bit with a tapered repair reamer. If you've never seen one of these, they're very handy for this type of thing. And then let's try that in there. If it doesn't line up, you can just keep adding shims until it does, but I don't want to go thicker because I don't have a lot of threads. So instead I went thinner. I just got the emery paper out and thinned down this copper shim, and that worked perfectly. So a little bit of elbow grease, and we've got a perfect fit. We'll thread the displacement lubricator on there, and it doesn't clear the cylinder head. Yeah, I didn't think of that. When doing these steam fitting operations, you got to really think about how everything is going to spin as you install it. So I could just remove the cylinder head to install it, but I don't want that kind of interference every time I do maintenance. So instead I made this little extension pipe out of some hex bar and I just turned it down to the same diameter as the boss on the lubricator so that it looks like it belongs. And then the little bit of hex left in the middle there will allow me to put a wrench on that if I ever need to. If you leave something totally round and it gets stuck over time, you'll never get it loose again without ruining it. Okay, let's try out the system here. So I'm topping up all the oil cups here with the pin bearing journal oil. I'm going to be running on air, so the lubricator is just going to be decorative here, and I've put oil inside the cylinder here. If you're going to run on air, you got to get oil inside the cylinder somehow. So you can pull the cylinder head off, inject some in there, or you can inject some in through the steam port and just hope it finds its way in there. But either way, don't run it too long on air without proper lubrication. So that's working really well. The lubricators on the crosshead slides are a little bit heavy-handed. They drain out pretty fast because there's just a very short passage there underneath them, and the uh, crosshead is just pulling oil out of them every time it runs by. So uh, that would be the only thing I might change is uh, maybe 
make a smaller hole in those lubricators, but otherwise it looks like it's performing really well. Engine's running well. So that's it for the lubrication system. And thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this segment. If you like what I'm doing here, maybe throw me a little love on Patreon and I will see you next time.